Well, the struggle is real. Am I right? The struggle is real. Say it with me. The struggle is real. The struggle is real. All right, but what is, what is the struggle? I mean, I know sometimes, like, I mean, our, our struggles can take on different forms, and there's different versions of the struggle, but the, the one universal truth here is that we know the struggle is real, that, that all of us as humans are, are struggling. In fact, it's the people who act like they're not struggling, they're the ones you gotta be really concerned with. The ones who act like they have it all together, you know below the surface, there's a, there's a hot mess going on in there. Because the thing we know is what? The struggle is real. It is real. But what is this struggle? I think the struggle really ultimately comes down to this. It's a power struggle. There is a power struggle. Now, we're certainly experiencing that culturally. I bet you can think of some, some power struggles that are afoot in the world that we're navigating. And we go, oh yeah, that's a, that's a massive power struggle. I would actually propose to you that's rather a minor, insignificant power struggle that we tend to elevate so that we don't have to deal with the real power struggle. You see, the real power struggle is going on in here. The real power struggle is the, is the struggle that is happening inside of our hearts every single day that is dictating how we feel, what we do, what we're worried about, the way we think, the way we pray, what we're interested in, how we consume, how we navigate this world. There is a, a power struggle that is going on on the inside. And, and the scary thing or crazy thing about this is this power struggle, it's, it's really a civil war. It's a war with self. And so and the deal is, is we're kind of trying to figure out who we are and why we are here, this great question of life. Who am I and what am I here for? And I just propose to you that that question is so important to answer, but I think it's impossible to answer until you understand who he is. Until you understand who God is and who you are in relationship to your creator, that power struggle within never goes away. It just takes on new versions and new forms, oftentimes getting nastier and bloodier and more difficult to navigate than they were before. And so the real question is to say, okay, who is my maker? Who is my creator? Who is this God who created me, who, who put me together and who placed me here? Who is this God that is inviting me into a relationship with him? This is the real issue at hand. And then when you discover who he is, well, we discover that because God is in the revealing business, God is always making himself known and, and revealing himself to us, um, that, that God became flesh and blood. He took human form. He sent his son Jesus here to earth for us so that we could understand who he is. The life of Jesus helps us understand who God is. God is love. Jesus is God. So Jesus is love personified. This is Jesus' love in flesh and blood form. So we look at the life of Jesus, um, what he did, how he spoke, who he hung out with, the way he lived his life, and we say, okay, this is what love really looks like. And so Christians are people who follow Christ. They follow Jesus. It means that we want to live like Jesus, talk like Jesus, think like Jesus, pray like Jesus, have relationships like Jesus had relationships, and, and to be like the one that we follow, which means that Jesus then is Lord. He, he's the God of love and he's the Lord of love. But if he's Lord, then that means that he has control. Now, if you are like me, and you probably are because you're human, then you have this power struggle thing happening with him. Who's going to be in charge of what you do, what you say, how you feel, what you think, how you spend your life, whether it be your time, your money, your possessions, your, your energies, the talents that have been entrusted to you. How are we going to navigate these things? They come down to this great power struggle within. And that's why God lets us know what he's ultimately most concerned with, and that is the condition of our souls. And so we're in this message series right now called Question Mark, where we're taking a little journey through the New Testament book of Mark. Uh, Mark is a gospel, so it tells the story of Jesus. And there are a number of questions that Jesus asked people throughout the book of Mark. And one of them is our memory verse, Mark chapter 8, verse 36. So I would love for you to read this out loud with me as we memorize it together. It says, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? This is kind of the ultimate question that Jesus is asking. Hey, this power struggle that, that's happening uh, in the world that you're living in and then it's happening inside your home, inside your job, inside your neighborhood, inside the community, inside your own heart, this power struggle that's going on there. He's like, this is a, really about a, a battle for control of your soul. 
And so he says to us, hey, what good is it to gain the whole world, like to have success, to have everything you ever dreamed of, to, to hit all your benchmarks, to make all your goals, to have all your wildest dreams come true? What good would it be to have all of that, all the things you ever thought you wanted or needed or could ever attain, and yet forfeit your soul? You see, what God is concerned about is the condition of our souls because our souls are eternal. Now, this is difficult for us to imagine because we're here in the temporal, the right here, the right now, with very real needs and wants and desires that we're not sure what we're supposed to do with them. And so the battle rages inside of us. It's a, it's a struggle, and the struggle is real, a struggle for power. So here's the thing about Jesus. Jesus is a threat to power. Jesus is a threat to power. Would you say that out loud with me? Jesus is a threat to power. Oh, yeah, this is true. He's a threat to power. Now, we hear about Jesus and we go, wait, this is good news, that, that God so loved us that he would send his son Jesus to come and die for us, to take away our imperfection, all of our sin, all the things that we've done that have harmed and hurt people that we love and people we may not even known about, all the things we neglected to do that we knew God wanted us to do that could have brought blessings and betterment to our world, plus all the things that have happened to us. The things that other people have done that, that have created ramifications and waves that have rushed over us and created pain that we don't know what to do with it, how to handle it. And so because of that, he sent his son Jesus, and Jesus came and went to the cross where he took all of that imperfection, mine and yours, and the imperfection of the entire world, inside of his body, and he put it to death in his body, and it was buried with him in the tomb, and on the third day, he rose again. And so this is the glorious, wonderful plan of God to put an end to the struggle that is going on inside of us where we understand he is the one who has authority over life and death. He creates life and he gives us new life through his resurrection into eternal life. And so this is the hope that we have. And so we look at Jesus and we say, okay, this is really good news. And you know what? You're right. It is really good news. In fact, it's the best news that's ever been told. It's incredible news. It's woohoo kind of news. It is great news, but it's also a threat because it means that Jesus has power. And if you have any ounce of power, no matter how big or small it is, if you have any ounce of power and you have any ounce of control and that power, you find a come across a greater power, that power is then threatened and Jesus is a greater power. So in our journey through the book of Mark, we're coming to the very final week of Jesus's life. He is in Jerusalem before he is uh, arrested and uh, put on trial where, where he'll be falsely accused and then he'll be handed over to be crucified where he is beaten and mocked and stripped naked and ultimately nailed to a cross and hung between two thieves where, where he died before he eventually rose again. But in this point in the story, Jesus is preparing for that moment, and he's spending time in the temple there in Jerusalem, and he's answering a lot of questions, and, and he's sharing and, and, and preaching good news to those who are around him. And he had, he had told a story, a parable is what they're called. Jesus had told this parable, and it was really about like the religious leaders of his day, and it was um, kind of indicting about them, and they knew it was about them. Like They're listening to it, and they're like, hey. I think he's talking about me. And the guy next to him is like, yeah, he's talking about you. It's like, wait, he's talking about you. Yeah, he's talking about us. And so they're, they're frustrated about it because they have, they have some power. Now, with that power also comes responsibility. We all know with great power comes great responsibility. So the, the religious leaders, they had responsibility to go with the power that was entrusted to them. They were leaders and they were religious leaders. But in this context, they weren't just religious leaders. It also made them political leaders. And they were navigating some really tricky political waters. The Jewish people um, were not sovereign on their own. They were being ruled by Rome at this point in history. And the, the Roman government, you know, they weren't notorious for being particularly gracious to, to people that they had, had conquered and were controlling. And so it was really important that the Jewish people play nice with Rome. And so the, the leaders were like going, okay, this is like a political powder keg that we've got going on here. You got Jewish people who are like, hey, we wanna be our own nation and we wanna do our own thing and they wanted to revolt against Rome. And, and so this power struggle, you know, that's coming from the inside is now manifesting itself into every aspect of life. And you have the, the religious leaders who are like responsible for all of this and they're kind of freaking out going, what's gonna happen here? And so they got this Jesus guy who's come into town on the back of a donkey where thousands of people lined the street and 
waved palm branches and threw their cloaks down on the ground and shouted, Hosanna, save us. They were proclaiming, you're our Messiah. You're our deliverer. You're the one who's gonna go kick Rome out of here and give us our nation back. And the religious leaders are going, oh no, this could go really bad. And they're right. It could go really bad. Because that's what happens in these, these struggles in this life. The struggle is real. And so they're checking Jesus out, and they've, they've got some questions. They've got some concerns. And now Jesus is saying some things uh, about them that people are understanding. And so there is a threat here to power. Jesus is a threat to power. So in Mark chapter 12, verse 13, referring to the religious leaders, it says, later they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. They came to him and said, Teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? Oh, hello. I find it interesting here that it does say later they sent some Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. First question is, who is they? Who's the they here? They would be the powers that be. There is always that nefarious they out there in the world. We all know that there is a they. Somebody who's pulling the strings, calling the shots, usually don't know their names. You know, usually have privy to the, the, the private meetings behind closed doors that are setting up these things, but there is a they that is at work. There was a they that was at work here. They sent some of the Pharisees and, and Herodians. Interesting pair to send together. Pharisees and Herodians. Pharisees were like the, the lawyers. Their job was to interpret the Old Testament law, 600 plus commands of God, uh, apply them to an ever-changing cultural dynamic, and then also enforce them um, this was like really hard job, brutal job. And uh, the Pharisees were waiting for a, uh, a king. They, they wanted to be a theocracy, Jerusalem, of the Israelites to be a theocracy with a king from the line of, of David, a Davidic kingdom. And so that's what they were hoping for and looking for. So they're checking Jesus out. Could he be this guy? Because he's not acting like what we expect and he's not doing the things the way we would do them. And it certainly doesn't look like this is gonna go the way we think it should go. So they got some problems. And then you have the Herodians. The Herodians were um, Jewish uh, leaders who were backing Herod as their king, um, which is a totally different guy. And they're like going, no, no, he's the guy. So the Pharisees and the Herodians are like two opposing political parties who are like, ah, ah, ah. And then they go, let's get Jesus. You know, and so they come together. They're like, this, this Jesus guy's a threat to us. So let's come together and let's go after him together because Jesus is a threat to power. So they come with the idea that they're gonna trap him in his words, which is just fantastic. In the book of John, in the first chapter, it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And then it says in verse 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. They're gonna go trap the word in his words. Love it. Great plan, good strategy, guys. I mean, this is the one who spoke everything into existence. He said, let there be light, and there was light. And so their, their plan is, let's go trap him in his words. Wow, let's see how that works out. And so they're going to catch him. So they come to him, and first thing they do is they, they butter him up. Typical, like, kind of political strategy here. Well, okay, it used to be, not anymore. But to flatter somebody. And so they, they come with these, these flattering words, and they say, don't teach her. We know that you're a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Okay, what do you want? What are you, what, what's going on here? They, they're coming at him and they're like, oh, okay, we know that you're all these things and you're so wonderful and you're so awesome. But then here's their question. They want to know about taxes. Should we be paying taxes to Caesar? Man, what a loaded question. What a loaded question, because now uh, in, in that region at that time, okay, Caesar was the ultimate kind of authority here. And so now here's this threat to their kind of localized authority, and they're coming to him going like, hey, you want to challenge Caesar? You, you want to go against him? You want to, because, you know, if you're going to, if he's trying to like raise up an army to revolt against Caesar and 
and to go uh, advance against Rome and to take back their nation and their country and be this kind of military king messiah like everybody was kind of expecting, then this would be the moment where he'd go, don't pay taxes. No, we're not. Like, like this would be like no taxation without representation kind of a moment. Uh, let, let's get this revolution moving here. Like they're setting him up. Like, is this, is this happening? Is this who you are? They're trying to to figure this out? Is this what's going to happen here? And it wouldn't have been the first time. There were other revolts that had happened, other would-be messiahs who had come up and who had said, hey, to, to pay taxes to Caesar, they said would actually be like treason against God because they, they were meant to be their own people, a sovereign nation. And so to, to pay taxes to Caesar would equal treason against God. And, and so, there, man, this is a lot of emotion going on here. Man, the struggle is real in this situation. And so they're coming at him with this taxes question, um, which is just interesting, like the, the, the struggle with taxes and should you pay, shouldn't you, and how much, and who, and when, and all. It's happening 2,000 years ago. Oh, yeah. yeah, so please don't be freaked out by the conversations that are happening. Don't, God's got it. He's, he's totally fine. Um, he's always a threat to uh, authority, but here's the thing about Jesus. Jesus is a threat to power, but Jesus is not threatened by power. <laughs> Let's go. He's always a threat to power, but Jesus is not threatened by power. So he's, he's, he's just not threatened by it. So in this situation, we, we can, okay, when it comes to Jesus, we can think, all right, when we are afraid, we don't really see clearly. And, and so they're looking at Jesus and they're seeing him here as a threat instead of a hope. They're seeing Jesus as a threat instead of a hope. And the same thing can happen to us. We can see Jesus as a threat instead of a hope. So here's the thing. Jesus is a threat to our power. He's a threat to our power. Now, when we understand that Jesus is a threat to our power, we have some options about what we can do. Like if he's the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, then what am I going to do with him? I'm, I'm coming kind of face to face with the reality of who Jesus is. He's the, the son of God uh, who became flesh and blood, who died for our sins, who conquered death and rose again, who has gone um, back to his father's house to prepare a room for you with your name on it and a seat at the father's table to, to get heaven ready for us and to make a way for us to be with him forever. What are we going to do with this force, this power? He's a threat to us because if we say yes to him as our savior and Lord, and then we try to go and do our own thing and live our own way, now we're back into the struggle is real. And it's more real than it's ever been before. So here's some things that we can do. We can ignore Jesus. We can just try to blow this off. Good luck with that. I mean, there's a reason that you're hearing these words right now. Because often we could try all we want to ignore Jesus, but God just has this wonderful way of getting our attention. I mean, it could be with the moon. It could be with the wind. It could be the beauty of a relationship with another person. It could be the, the creation itself. God is all the time saying, hey, I'm real, and I'm for you, and I love you, and, and I made you, and I have reason for you, so good luck trying to ignore him. That's why, like, being an atheist, man, that's really hard work. <laughs> like, I like to think of my person, myself as a person of faith. I do not have enough faith to be an atheist. That's a lot of work. There's a lot of ignoring you have to do, and I'm not ridiculing it. I'm just saying, like, I got some respect for you. You got more faith than I do, because that's hard to do. It's, it's hard. Now, an agnostic, somebody tries to say, hey, I don't, I don't know, and I don't really care. I don't think it really matters. Also hard work, which is why typically atheists and agnostics talk about it so much. It's like a vegetarian. You ever notice how much they talk about meat? <laughs> it's like, I get it. You're not eating meat, but you want to. I get it. You're not worshiping Jesus, but you want to. I understand. I, I, so it's hard, and, and, and there, there's compassion in that. Um, we can also reject Jesus. We can just say, nope, not for me. Like, I'm not ignoring you. I'm just intentionally rejecting you. Um, not a great choice. And again, it takes a lot of work and a lot of energy. Um, we can try to fight Jesus. Like maybe we say yes to him, but we're not really submitting to the lordship of Jesus. So inside, we're like fighting against him and like going against him all the time. And it's exhausting. The duplicity is, is so maddening, maddening because here's the one who has ultimate authority. Another thing we can do is we can flatter Jesus. 
We can flatter, just like the, the guys here were doing. They, they came to him and, hey, Jesus, this is who you are. So, so we could spend some time saying, oh, God, you're so wonderful, and God, you're so loving, and God, you're so great, and you know, I'm gonna give you some lip service, and I'm gonna give you some time, and I'm, I'm gonna give you some worship, and you know, I, I'm, I'm gonna, you know, maybe, I don't know, get like a chosen sweatshirt or something. I'm gonna, <laughs> like, I'm in, I don't know. And it's like, you're, you're really great, you know? Jesus is my homeboy. And, but is he Lord or is he just, is it just flattery? And are we just like kind of like throwing some things out there? Wow, that, that one might be the scariest one of all. It's hardest to recognize. And nobody can tell you, you, you know, that, that's, that's an internal thing where you're wrestling and going, hey, God, where am I in this? Or we can submit to Jesus. And that's where it's at. To submit, to, to say yes to not only him as, as Savior, but also as Lord. And so, I mean, Jesus, whatever power we have, he's not threatened by that, which is what makes him so wonderful. We can trust him. He's not threatened by it. So they come to him, you know, with this question about paying taxes. And so let's see what Jesus answers. The next verse, verse 15 of Mark 12 it says, but Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me? He asked, bring me a denarius and let me look at it. What a great question. Why, why are you trying to trap me? Like, I, I just love that about Jesus. He's not mad. He's not all frustrated. He doesn't storm out and walk away. He just knows their hypocrisy, and he gets it. And he just says, why are you, why are you trying to trap me? Give me a coin. Give me a denarius. A denarius a, it's a, a day's wages in that time and place. And um, it was uh, the coin that was used to pay uh, the, the tax. Um, to Caesar. It was a, like a tribute penny is sometimes what it was called. And he's like, just bring me one of those. Let me, let me see the coin you're talking about for paying the taxes. Now, what's interesting about this is, you know, since some of these Jewish people thought that paying these taxes would be treasonous, they also kind of looked, looked at this coin and they, and they believed that because of whose image was on it and whose inscription was on it, um, that it would be like um, idolatry to even touch it. And Jesus, but Jesus isn't even threatened by that. He's not threatened about what other people think. He's not threatened about their judgment. He's not putting on a show here. He's just like, bring me the coin. And he takes the coin. I, I will tell you this, like, even, if, even if there's been hypocrisy in your heart and the struggle with Jesus and who he is and his authority, he loves you. He's patient with you. He's gracious and compassionate. And just saying, hey, let me take a look in there. Let me do that with you. Let's, let's, see, let's see what's going on here. Let's see if we can get this sorted out and, and settle this struggle maybe once and for all. So Jesus is a threat to power, but he's not threatened by power because Jesus is the ultimate power. Amen. Jesus is the ultimate power. Would you say that with me? Jesus is the ultimate power. Yeah, he has all authority and power. And so at that time and place, all right, so you have, um, you know, Rome. And so what Jesus does, he's like, give me the denarius. Let me look at it. Next verse, verse 16, it says, they brought the coin, um, and he asked them, okay, whose, whose image is this? And whose inscription? The Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, all right, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. And they were amazed at him. What a great answer. Like they're trying to trap him and like get him all up in this, you know, debate and conversation and who's, who's got the power and who's gonna take control and everything else. And he's just like, hey, give me the coin. Oh, okay, whose picture? Caesar. Whose inscription? Caesar. It's like, you just see him like, he's so cool. He just flipped it to him. Man, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. You know, Caesar's concerned about taxes. Caesar's all worried about money. Caesar's all interested in tribute. Caesar's all about having his image on a coin. Caesar's all about the power and, 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 and trying to hold it and keep it and maintain it and, and expand. Caesar's about all those things. And, and so Jesus is like, let him have it. I, just, I think this is fantastic. Let him have it. What are you fighting? What's all, what's all this about? Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. And then what does he say? Give to God what is God's. What's he talking about? What is God's? Is it that coin? This coin that we think is such a big deal, the economy, taxes, oh no, what are we gonna do? Is this, is this what he's talking about? What matters most? 
to God. I'll give you a hint. It was in our memory verse. What good is it to gain the whole world and yet forfeit your soul? Give to God what is God's. What does God want? Your soul. This is what he wants. So you know what? We can, we can drop all this fear and worry about the economy and taxes and all this stress. I mean, I know the struggle is real, but I'm gonna give you a glorious answer for this struggle. His name's Jesus. Jesus is ultimate power. And in him, he can bring peace to a weary, anxious heart. I'm, I'm an example of that. He can do it. I know he can, I know he can do it with you. No matter what is going on, trust him with your soul. This is what belongs to God, you your very soul. And this is what he desires more than anything. And so when we share in a time of communion together, we're remembering the great uh, links that God went to to demonstrate and prove his love for us and his desire for us, that he longs for you, that God is madly, passionately, head over heels in love with you no matter who you are or what you've done or what's been done to you. God is for you and he sent his son Jesus to make a way for you to be with him forever. And so whether you have bread and juice with you or not, you can participate by remembering and responding to Jesus. Jesus took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is given to you. He offers himself to you as a wonderful sacrifice. Would you say yes to Jesus as your savior? Yes. And Jesus also took a cup. And he said, this cup is a wonderful reminder of a new relational dynamic between us and God. That he's not just our savior, but he's also Lord, but not just any Lord, the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, ultimate power, ultimate authority. And when you say yes to Jesus as Lord, then he reigns in your heart. He has authority and dominion over your soul. So we drink to the King, to the King. Right now, I'd like to invite you to spend a few moments before your God and just acknowledge to him that the struggle is real. So a couple of things you can do. One thing is you can say, God, can you help me understand the struggle that is inside of me? Can you help me? He'll, he'll help you. Just say, God, can you help me? And then the second thing is, will you submit to Jesus? And if you've been rejecting or running or flattering him, here's an opportunity for you to submit and just say, God, I submit to you. Let's spend this time with him right now.